The all-party parliamentary middleway group was set up in 1998 by a group of MPs from all parties to find a workable solution to the problem of hunting with dogs, a solution based on animal welfare and hard fact, not prejudice. And our approach now is based on two key elements, licensed hunting and an amendment to the Wild Mammals Protection Act which would redefine the way law treats cruelty to wild mammals. When we set up the Middleway Group in uh, 1998, it was very important to find evidence to convince people of the need to have a licensing system and also a system that protected animals. And the more evidence we could get, the better. The Middleway Group's research is not an attack on shooting. It's a challenge to the assumption that all shooting is good and all hunting with dogs is bad. We didn't feel that there was conclusive evidence to show that, and we've hoped to fill the vacuum of information uh, by doing this objective research. With the government's hunting bill now under consideration by Parliament, it's all the more important that Parliament and the general public have access to hard facts about the realities of hunting and the other methods of control. That factual evidence just isn't available in the way people might expect, despite all the many inquiries the government has held. And it's particularly important we look at the real consequences for animal welfare of the other methods of control if hunting is banned. We just don't know what the different levels of suffering are in the different activities used to control foxes. Over the years, a lot of scientific evidence has been produced, but it isn't scientific evidence at all, it's opinion, masquerading as scientific evidence. At the Phelps inquiry, the Burns inquiry, the Portcullis House hearings, it became clear we really needed a new body of evidence. Without that evidence, we just cannot make the judgments necessary to inform debate about the possibility of banning hunting. So the Middle Way Group is setting out to assess what should have been done before. Scientifically, the suffering that's entailed with these different methods. Uh, and what are these legal methods? Snaring is still legal. Shooting, either with a shotgun or rifle, is legal. The use of live traps is legal and is used in towns but is not very practical in rural areas. And hunting with dogs such as hounds above ground or terriers below ground, they're all legal at the moment. Now I've got a snare here. This is a fox snare. Now, isn't one type of snare illegal? Yes, if it's a self-locking snare, in other words, it tightens up on the animal and then won't unlock, that is illegal. But this is a free-running snare, it's commercially available in the shops and it can be used by anybody without a licence. And what regulations cover the use of the snare? Legally, you have to check them every 24 hours, but otherwise, frankly, there's very little regulation on them. For example, they recommend that you don't set a fox snare where there are badgers. But everywhere in Britain are badgers. So really anyone can get hold of these and use them? Yep. And 50% of the animals caught in these snares are not foxes. They're badgers, lambs, pet dogs, pet cats. These are efficient because it takes you two minutes to set it. It's working for you 24 hours a day. We know that snaring is an efficient method of pest control and equally we know that suffering is involved. If you check your snare once every 24 hours, for example first thing in the morning, a fox could be caught at any time of day or night and it'll be struggling all that time and getting exhausted often dying in the process. Many hang themselves in a hedge bank and so on. In the case of this badger, it's been caught in a fox snare set in a fence line and the snare has caught it round the body behind the front legs. You can see where the badger has churned up the soil trying to escape all night long. The badger itself is covered in mud, it's exhausted, it's been biting at the hawthorn of the hedge and getting it out is quite a difficult task. Badgers have a strong bite 
you have to be very careful. So guns, what's the difference between a gun and a rifle? Well by gun we normally mean a shotgun and this is a double barrel 12 bore very lethal weapon at close quarters. It's normally used for shooting moving targets such as rabbits and pheasants. Why 12 bore? What does that mean? 12 bore comes from the diameter of the barrel. If in the old days when they had muskets, if you got a pound of lead and chopped it up into 12 equal pieces, and made each piece into a spherical musket ball, that ball would fit down a 12 bore. Now if you chopped it into 20 pieces, that would fit in a 20 bore. So a 20 bore is actually a smaller diameter barrel than a 12 bore, although the number's bigger. Is a 20 bore the smallest you can get? No, you can get smaller than a 20 bore. This, for example, is a 410, a 0.410 of an inch. And this is a 12 bore. You can see there's quite a big difference. 410 is used in areas such as around the gardens, places where you don't want the shot to go away off into the distance and injure somebody. What would you normally use a 410 for? Often for rats and rabbits, that kind of thing. But this 410 is legal for use on foxes. So is there anything smaller than a 410? Below 410, you're talking about air rifles. Now, air rifles don't use cartridges. They use air pressure from compressing a spring underneath the barrel. And they use a single little lead pellet like this. It's actually legal to fire one of these at a fox as well. Uh, and there are many complaints because people shoot air rifles at marauding cats in gardens. And this pellet can penetrate the skin of the fox or the cat, but it won't normally do any lethal damage, it'll just wound. At the moment, there's no legislation preventing you from using any of these guns on foxes. So the air gun fires an air gun pellet. What, what's in a shotgun cartridge? Well, the shotgun cartridge consists of a plastic tube with a lot of small round pellets, normally lead but sometimes steel or other metals. It has a cap at this end which, when it's hit by the pin in the gun, sets off a charge of powder and by means of the wad providing a gas tight seal that shoots it up the barrel. Now it's a trade-off because in this AAA cartridge there are 39 pellets and each one's quite big. You can shoot at quite a long range, maybe 60 yards, and have quite good penetration. This cartridge consists of number six shot. Now number six shot is about 300 pellets in here but much smaller. This would normally be intended for things like pigeons and pheasants, that kind of thing. So when that lot goes out of the barrel, there's a lot of them and they'll spray all over the animal, but because they don't have the size, they will not penetrate so much. And so for a larger animal like the fox, they'll just hit the skin, maybe go in a centimetre or so and run out of steam. So they'll wound. Okay, now the choke in a shotgun is a tightening of the barrel in the last three inches or so. So from the chamber at this end you have a straight 12 bore tube till you get to about here. And then it narrows, it's like focusing a torch beam. And that focuses the spread of shot from a wide spread down to a narrower spread. Now normally we'd have the 
first barrel to be fired will be fairly open and the second barrel will be more of a choke barrel. So when you put the gun up, you've got an instant choice. If the target's a long way away, you'll use the back trigger, which fires the choke barrel. If it's quite close, instead of blowing it to bits, you use the front trigger and the open barrel. But as you say, it's a sort of trade-off because presumably it'll be a tighter pattern when you're using the choke. Yes, and paradoxically, if you use your choke barrel at short range, you might bl blow a hole in it, or you might miss it. Completely. Yeah. Conversely, if you use your open barrel at a long range, quite likely you'll hit it, but you won't hit it with enough pellets to kill it, so you're more likely to wound it. So there are numerous factors here. The pellet size, the distance you're at, the choke use, and the speed of the, the target as well. Yes. These are all crucial factors in trying to hit an animal cleanly with a shotgun. Exactly, and that's why we've designed our study to examine each of those different parameters separately and the wounding entailed by each parameter. The thing about a rifle is that it fires a single projectile, a bullet, and it's called a rifle because, unlike the shotgun which has a smooth barrel, the rifle has grooves in the barrel. Quite hard to see, but these grooves are cut in a spiral, so it's a rifled barrel. So this is for firing a bullet over a longer distance accurately, whereas the shotgun is a short range spraying kind of a weapon. So using a rifle is a much trickier matter. You must know where the bullet will stop if you miss the target. This is the risk you face if you're in an area where the public have access, right to roam, and particularly if you're using it in the dark and you can't see. So you've got to know the ground that you're operating on. Yes. So both of these weapons can be used on foxes legally. How are you going to assess the suffering that they may cause? The big difficulty when you're trying to look at wounding involved in shooting is that the animal runs away. So basically when you fire a shot with a gun, three things can happen. Either the animal will drop dead, and so you know it's dead, or it will run away. And of the animals that run away, it could be completely missed, or it could be wounded. And you have no way of knowing for sure whether it's wounded or not. So the first thing we're doing is we are gathering data from real fox shoots. And we exactly. cannot get hold of live foxes and start shooting them. I don't think anyone would be very pleased if we tried that. So we have to use target foxes. And we need to have a lot of them. We need to have them behaving in a very similar way to a real fox. We need to use the same ranges, the same guns, the same ammunition and the same people that are used in normal fox shooting and we need to fire enough shots at enough artificial foxes to get our scientific sample sizes. So our first difficulty was to prepare a proper anatomically correct fox target. How did you get that? Well, let me show you, Jim. Now, first of all, we obtained a vixen of five kilograms. This is a real fox. We then froze her in a running position and we split her along the midline and with all the organs frozen by putting clear acetate over it we can trace exactly the position of the skull, the brain, the spinal cord, all the internal organs, and by doing further dissections, 
of the limbs, for example, we can trace where the shoulder blade is, the pelvis, and so on. And this means that we can produce a target like this, which is exactly life size, and where we can see the skin line, the vertebrae, the ribs, shoulder blade, the heart, diaphragm, liver, and so on. And that means when our target fox is fired at, we can see the exact placement of each pellet on the target. That will tell you the spread of the shot, but how do you know how deep the shot may have gone? This is a difficult question. The only way we can do that is to obtain dead foxes, which people have shot, and we ask them to record what shot size and what range they have shot them at. We also obtained dead foxes that had been snared or headshot. We suspended them in the same position as the target and we shot them from one side in the same regimes as in the target trials. The pathologist dissected all these carcasses to determine the effects of pellets on the internal organs. We also measured shot penetration comparatively by shooting at layers of standardised card, by counting the minimum and maximum numbers of cards penetrated we can get a good index of each of the regimes we tested. The results from these penetration tests were entered into the database and are given in the written report. By combining all this information, the pathologist scored the targets as either killed, heavily wounded, lightly wounded or missed. And what do you do with the targets? Presumably the fox is moving in real life. How do you simulate that? Well we put the fox target onto uh, a moving sledge and we have one going from left to right and the other going from right to left. It's going the speed of a fast trotting fox not really fast, but quite fast, in a typical situation which the no shooter normally faces. Shotgun trials were run in daylight and on moving fox targets. OK. We fired 1,283 shots with 170 different shooters using the different regimes. Jim, can I introduce you to Robert Bucknell? He's an expert on shooting foxes and is the author of a modern book, a technical book, on fox control with firearms. Robert, why did you write such a book? I've been interested in carrying out fox control for a good many years and I thought that perhaps the time had come as the debate was getting uh, more polarised to write a, a book that not only was a technical manual for those that are interested but an overview on what is becoming a sport. What rifles are legal and suitable for fox control? Any rifle is legal, that's no problem there as far as the law is concerned, they're not covered, uh, there's nothing specific, but of course if you're going to do the job properly you're going to try and take out something that will kill the fox as rapidly as it possibly can do so. You've seen the 2-2 earlier on, small cartridge used for rabbits, brilliant for that, very cheap, three pence, three and a half pence around. Farmers use them a lot to cut down vermin, this is a semi-automatic gun takes a magazine of 10 rounds, each time you pull the trigger it operates, so it's very good for rapid shooting of, of small vermin. People that go on to fox control as a, as a job or as a sport 
go up to the 22 centrifires, which are a much bigger cartridge. These have a real clout to them, and the bullet expands much better when it hits something and, and transfers a lot of energy into it that knocks the animal down much quicker and more efficiently than this little cartridge. And what's the difference between a high velocity rifle and a subsonic rifle? Ah, now that's where the 22 does come in because with a subsonic round, which is travelling below a thousand feet a second, it doesn't have a supersonic crack travelling through the air. And so dealing with small vermin, you can sneak up on them uh, and, and keep shooting them. They don't realise what is happening. As soon as you go to a high velocity gun, which is travelling at perhaps three, three and a half thousand feet a second, a lot faster, supersonic crack going through the air, so there's a lot more disturbance to the surrounding wildlife and to, to people standing around, but a lot more efficient. The centrifires that are, are used these days start off usually with a triple two and the two two three, and most probably go up to two four three. Most of the rifles in use, or many of the rifles, are now equipped with heavy barrels, good telescopic sights and sound moderators. Although they don't moderate the crack from the bullet, they take out the bang from the discharge. And so it's a lot more pleasant to use for those standing around, it doesn't hurt their ears, and again it doesn't disturb the quarry if you've got a, a number out there. But you can use both of these types of rifle on foxes. Oh, absolutely. It's down to the person in the right place and the right time. This little 2-2 would be very effective out to 60 or 70 yards, again down to the skill of the operator. Whereas the centrefire works extremely well at 100 yards and it will still kill a fox very well out to 300. How do you get closer to the fox or how do you get the fox closer to you? Yes, either you walk out or drive out and go after the fox or you try and call the fox in. One of the methods that's used is to imitate the distress cry of a, of a potential victim, like a rabbit. Or a hare. The fox will come towards you, present you hopefully with a frontal shot as it's coming in, or perhaps a turning shot as it's questioning to see what uh, the, the noise has come from. Uh, presents a small target but also maximum wounding area because the rest of the fox is behind it. I notice you've got reflective eyes on this fox target. What, what are they for? Well much of the hunting is taking place at night because that's when the fox is out. Um, as we're using a lamp the fox's eyes return the shine from that lamp and so it's used as a, as a marker to pick up the fox and see where it is. Of course you shouldn't just shoot at the eyes because from the safety point of view you don't know what is behind the eyes. Essex is an arable country, there aren't many sheep around, why is the fox a pest here? Absolutely right, there's very few livestock in Essex, but what there are, as we get to the consumer wanting free-range animals, I find more and more inquiries from people with free-range chickens or pigs. Uh, a chap contacted me last week and he was losing 15 piglets a week. But of course with game, it's another terrific part of the economy in this area, from sport and uh, there are now commercial shoots, and to them, a fox taking a pheasant that may be worth £20 is a, a, a big reason for going out there and culling them as hard as they can. Do you have a fox hunt in this area? Yes. What would the attitude be if fox hunting was to be banned? Well, I'm sure the sporting element would, would start to go as far as that's concerned, and foxes would suffer. There would be a lot more killed because there'd be no reason for keeping them on the ground. Do you think fox numbers would go up or down? I think they would go down. Of, say, a hundred foxes shot with a rifle, how many would uh, be shot dead? Experienced shot mostly deals with 30 foxes, but we have a miss or, or perhaps wounds one. So three foxes, say. And what happens to the ones that uh, get away? Very often they're a complete miss because a fox moves or something happens so that the, the operator knows that it has gone away unwounded. But there is an occasional shot where a fox is not found and uh, it has gone away, obviously hit. Uh, and what happens to it later, we don't know. It's most probably it dies within a week. How would you raise the level of the inexperienced shooter to that of the, the competent shooter? Hopefully they will uh, take up range practice and, and test and adjust and keep shooting until their level of competence, they're happy with it uh, before they go out and shoot live quarry. So anyone can go out and buy a rifle and shoot foxes with it? 
In theory, yes, but you need permission from the police with a firearm certificate. You need permission from a landowner who will look at you very hard, and it helps if you're sane. How many man hours would there be for every fox killed? Depending on the density of foxes, but maybe three hours up to seven or eight. And who pays for that? It's either somebody's on their own land and doing their own work. There's a gamekeeper who is being remunerated for looking after the, the, the area and, and culling the vermin there. Or in a lot of cases it's sport shooting where somebody is enthusiastic and uh, offers their services usually for free. Robert, you've been kind enough to run some rifle shooting what? trials for the Middleway Group on your land. How much do you think they relate to reality in the field? Quite a lot. I was talking to the shooters that took part and they found it a very interesting exercise. Uh, they normally uh, target shoot, but to be able to shoot at a, a fox target showing the layout of the uh, inside, uh, they found very valuable. I noticed there seemed to be quite a difference between uh, the, the shots that were taken unsupported and supported the rifle supported. Have you any thoughts on that? Oh absolutely. This is something that you notice as it always happens and it means that most people take care of trying to shoot from a supported position and many of the uh, professionals go out and they change their vehicles to put frames and, and various mounts on so that they can rest the rifle before taking a shot. Rifle trials were done both by day and by night on static targets only. We fired 885 rifle shots in the different regimes with 29 different rifle shooters. All the trials together entailed 2,168 shots with about 200 different shooters in England, Scotland and Wales. And we delivered all the targets to the pathologists for analysis. Rifles are capable of producing good results, but how desirable is it for more guns to be in circulation? Although legal gun owners adhere to strict controls, gun crime in cities is an increasing worry Snaring and shooting inevitably entail long hours of suffering for some of the foxes. The only way to ensure a quick death without the risk of wounding is to use dogs alone. They will either kill it or it will escape unharmed. One way to reduce wounding is to quickly fire a second shot. But even second shots may fail to kill. Even from short range, multiple shots may not kill the fox. This fox is badly wounded, but still manages to get away. The only hope then is to call the hounds and hope that they can catch it and put it out of its misery. Of course, where hounds are used alone, the problem of wounding doesn't arise. If foxes are to be shot at, then the use of suitable dogs can do much to prevent further suffering. If the wounded fox gets down a hole, the only way to locate it is using a terrier. It can mark the fox and the men can locate it by the transmitter on its collar. Then the men can dig down to shoot the fox. The Middleway group believe 
that terrier work should only be done by licensed persons under strict controls. The scoring was done independently by the International Zoo Veterinary Group and by Dr Douglas Wise from the Department of Clinical Veterinary Medicine at the University of Cambridge. Now obviously we can't show all the results in the film, they're in the report, but we can point out some trends. The most noticeable is the considerable variation. You can see this both in the target trials and with the gun packs. One gun pack, for example, had a kill rate of 20%, whereas another gun pack had a kill rate of 79%. Looking at shotguns, the pie chart shows kills in black, heavily wounded in red, lightly wounded in yellow, and white is misses. With number 6 at 25 yards, the skilled shooters hit all the foxes at a cost of 73% wounded. The unskilled shooters missed 36% of the foxes, but paradoxically only wounded 52%. Across all the shotgun regimes, the unskilled shooters missed more and killed less than the semi-skilled and skilled shooters, but they also wounded less. Skill in shooting improves efficiency, but does not necessarily improve welfare. The number 6 shot also had the lowest kill rate and the highest wounding rate because of its poor penetration. And at 40 yards the skilled shot still hit all the foxes but wounded 96% of them. The 410 at 25 yards also wounded rather than killed. AAA at 40 yards and 60 yards suffers from having too few pellets. Only 2 or 3 might hit the fox. And no matter how skilled the shooter, it was potluck if a pellet hit a vital spot. BB was the optimum fox load of those we tested, being the best balance between pattern density and penetration. But neither BB nor AAA could consistently kill 50% of the foxes beyond 40 yards, and wounded about half of them in the process. Range was the critical factor, BB at no more than 25 yards, probably being the most humane. Rifles fired from arrest by skilled shooters had excellent kill rates, even in the dark. But less experienced shooters, or people shooting unsupported, had poorer results. The use of second shots, and of dogs to find and catch wounded foxes, can do a lot to reduce the numbers of foxes escaping injured. But however disciplined and conscientious the shooter, wounding is inevitable. There's also the risk of injury to others. In this case, fortunately, only a car when the fox ran in front of it. A lot of effort's been spent on rhetoric and not much on research. Uninformed opinions hardly worth having. It's time the government had the maturity to tackle these wildlife management issues, including welfare, on a scientific basis and with a balanced sense of priorities.